the big area of research and controversy in melanoma is what do you do when someone's been on these effective therapies and they become resistant? So either resistant or recurrent disease. So Mike, do you biopsy patients who progress, say on BRAF mech inhibition? Do you want to find out what the mechanism of resistance is? Or is this something that would not impact on your management and you just wouldn't do it? Certainly working in a large academic center, it's really a high priority to us, you know, finding those sort of clinical scenarios that have truly unmet needs. I mean, the therapy, so specifically within the uh, the targeted therapy world, you know, the, the reason we developed the combination of BRAF and MEC together was because of biopsying patients who progressed on single agent BRAF inhibitor therapy. The, the fact of the matter is, is that the therapies we have now are actually a product of actually sort of collecting those types of tumor samples but and you really trying to do figure it that out. For clinical use, you do it for Correct. your research program to try and push the field forward and find better and newer drugs, right? Yeah. But as a clinician out there in the community who's not part of an academic research program, sure, if you can get in on it add your samples, but you wouldn't do it to make a clinical decision, would you? Particularly in terms of standard therapies. There are, there are actually a number of clinical trials like NCI Match, where actually you can do biopsies, do molecular profiling, and if there is a targetable lesion, that they can get matched up to a clinical trial for that. And so, you know, in that way, it could potentially actually sure. impact clinical care. Sure. Um, but, you know, in terms of if we're talking about, um, you know, sort of standard of care FDA approved agents, it's not quite clear that that biopsy at this point would, would help inform us. Certainly, one of the things we do know for patients progressing on targeted therapy, that that BRAF mutation is still there. We don't see patients converting to a BRAF wild type phenotype. Right. So, Jason, do you think there's a different uh, manner or biology of progression in someone who gets targeted therapy or someone who gets immunologic therapy? Is there any difference? Well, I think there's certainly a biological difference. Um, the clinical difference, I think, um, is a little bit. Uh, I don't know, it would, it would be harder to exactly profile the difference. I mean, I think uh, with targeted therapy as well as early uh, use of immunotherapy earlier on, um, I, I think we commonly see that lesions that were present will start to progress. We do sometimes see with targeted therapy that will, there will be new lesions, but I think the, the broad point I would like to make in that space is that if you see disease control with one or one progressing lesion or one new lesion and so on and so forth that again the multidisciplinary approach of handling that lesion especially in the community where you know perhaps they're not going to have access to eight novel trials of new agents uh, really sort of maximizing the things that we do have and so e even in the university setting I've started to use a lot more um, stereotactic radiation to sites of progression um, even sometimes to multiple sites at once if the if the patient has been deriving benefit from a therapy whether it be PD-1 whether it be BRAF mac um, if I think I can get those few sites and then keep them and they seem to be doing well, I, I employ those strategies quite, quite commonly. Although, what are the triggers to switching? In other words, like, it seems to me that we've developed a philosophy over the last decade, whether it be for targeted or immunotherapy, that you can treat beyond progression, meaning we're a little reticent to switch. But, I mean, Mike, when do you switch? Well, well actually, so I think one of the one of the things that's uh, worth sort of talking about too that's relatively new data, um, again, thinking about the targeted therapy, is that there was a trial published in Lancet Oncology and actually a similar experience reported at ASCO patients who were BRAF mutant who were treated with targeted therapy who progressed, who then went on to receive immunotherapy, who then progressed on immunotherapy, who were then re-challenged with BRAF met combinations. And that in both of those studies, while there's some heterogeneity, particularly in the uh, uh, data that was presented at ASCO, there was a very reasonable response rate to re-challenge with the targeted therapy. Um, that the data is, is that those forces that drive for the selection of resistant clones in the presence of targeted therapy, those same molecular changes may not be so favorable when patients are off of the targeted therapy and those resistant clones may actually disappear such that if somebody develops resistance to targeted therapy, that is not necessarily a permanent change. Uh, and so, you know, when you talk about these refractory patients, I think this is sort of an example of where we sort of have this new paradigm potentially of being able to go back to therapies that worked previously. Okay, and Georgina, would you re-challenge with targeted therapy? Let's say you get a response to targeted therapy transiently, they go on immunotherapy, then they progress, would you go back to targeted therapy? I would in certain circumstances, but again, it would be a multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, patients are very different and heterogeneous, so you'd have to consider the patient in front of you. So for example, um, if a patient progressed in one very easily resectable site on immunotherapy, I tend to find, this is gut feel we're talking now and just experience, sure. that progression on immunotherapy after a response typically is slow and easy to manage. So I would manage with local therapy in that situation. 
However, if they develop multiple uh, sites of progression or multiple brain metastases, yeah, you may be forced to switch therapy or consider other therapies. But again, the bottom line is it does need to be uh, tailored to the individual patient and done with a multidisciplinary approach of using radiotherapy, surgery, maybe switch drugs, but you need to, to look at the whole picture. And Jason, how many lines of therapy are your patients getting? I mean, do you, do you think about IL-2 at all? Well, so two questions. Uh, one is lines of therapy, one is IL-2. Lines of therapy is that it, uh, you know, they get many, many lines of therapy now. I mean, and we keep, you know, because now we have this idea of recycling therapies. I, it's always looking for how do we maximize what we got? How do we think about the next step? And for many patients, especially at a referral center like an academic center, we see a lot of younger patients. So then we're really trying to think out how are we going to, you know, plan this out over a very long period of time? So I, I actually don't even know what the median number of lines of therapy is that my patients get. Now, is IL-2 one of them? I would have to say that it's less common that I refer for IL-2 at this point. Um, I think that's partly because of what we just said, where patients will cycle through many lines of therapy, and IL-2 is still a, a difficult treatment for patients to, uh, to tolerate, so they have to kind of be in pretty good shape in order to consider that. We do consider it at some points. I, I have referred a few people in the last year, and I have to say I've seen patients go into CRs after they've been and refractory to all the available therapies. So it's, it's still something that's out there, uh, but I would say it's not used commonly. And then the question is, what do you do in someone who's BRAF wild type who fails Zippy Nevo? What's your next step? Robert, what do you recommend to patients? I think that those are really difficult patients. And I think that in, in that setting, um, we recommend a clinical trial for those patients. I what about that, TVEC? I mean, does so, TVEC work in a, in a relapsed or recurrent immunotherapy resistant patients? So it, it, it's a very good question. So I think first of all we have to remember that in order for us to be able to use TVEC or an interlesional therapy, we've used these primarily in patients that have dermal subcutaneous or lymph metastases that we can inject. We have not used these routinely in, in visceral lesions. Not that we couldn't do it, but it hasn't been part of the clinical trials. So I think that if we, in this specific situation, Jeff, if we have a patient then that has been on a checkpoint inhibitor, a PD-1 inhibitor, been on ipilimumab, they're BRF wild type, and the next question is what do we do then? We can use these oncolytic immunotherapies to try to change the tumor microenvironment. Now we've done this, not necessarily with TVEC, but the other clinical trials that we've reported on, where we can actually find that often when we do a biopsy of these lesions, they have very few tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And really for us to think about it is in order for these checkpoint inhibitors to work, we really need to have the lymphocytes in the tumor for that to occur. And we can then inject them with these oncolytic viruses to change the tumor microenvironment. And we've, um, we've reported on several of these where at that point in time, we can probably also then reinitiate some of those checkpoint inhibitors to try to get a response. Now, whether that works consistently, we don't know, but we are currently running clinical trials where we can do that. And one of those things is, um, is potentially TVEC in there, but also other oncolytic immunotherapies. So, Jeff, can I just use a dirty word, which is chemotherapy? Sure. So, <laughs> something which, uh, you know, actually does, does not have a role in frontline therapy, but actually in the NCCN guidelines is actually, a, a, you know, an, an option for second or third line therapy. And I would have to say, again, one of the things that we end up talking about with colleagues at meetings is that I think the impression that some of us have is that we have seen patients who were refractory to immune therapies subsequently treated with chemotherapy who've not only had responses, but responses that seem much more durable than what we're used to seeing with chemotherapy. Um, there's, we've published a case report on this. I know others have published case reports on this, um, that you know there, there is another option there, particularly for your patients who aren't eligible for clinical trials, that you can see very dramatic responses to chemotherapy, I found, in the immunotherapy refractory patients.